Good morning and welcome to my study. Thank you so much for clicking on this video and joining us here this morning. My name is Chris and I'm Pastor Langley Emanuel. And in these series of videos every week, we come together to think theologically and liturgically about what it means to be Christian in the 21st century. Last week, I did a video uh, called, What is Salvation? Uh, and that generated some really good discussions, some really good feedback in the comments and in emails and in some of the small groups around our church. Uh, and one of those comments came from a member of our church uh, who remarked that it was a really good discussion. It was interesting to see how uh, I spent some time talking about five things that we are saved from. And then he asked that it might be interesting to also explore uh, certain things that we are saved to or for. And uh, I thought that was a really good idea. And so uh, put that away and we're going to spend some time this morning doing just that. Uh, maybe looking at uh, the sort of parallel to what we began in conversation last week. And so I want to spend some time uh, looking together at what it means to be saved. What is our uh, good and biblical and uh, more comprehensively uh, discerned understanding of the word salvation? What really is the scope of the gospel? Uh, if you haven't seen last week's video, I encourage you to check that out uh, and then come back and follow up here. Last week, we began by saying that we are saved from the wrath of God for salvation. And today, the parallel to that, I want to say that we are saved to holiness, or we, are, uh, we receive salvation unto holiness. Uh, it was R.C. Sproul who said uh, in his book, The Mystery of the Holy Spirit, he said that in salvation, we're not only saved from sin and damnation, we are saved unto holiness. The goal of redemption is holiness. Now, holiness is a really interesting word, right? Because when we hear the word holy in our modern minds, um, we often immediately go to obedience or behavior or morality. We think of uh, negative phrases like holier than thou. And uh, well, there's part of that uh, encapsulated in the word holy. Uh, primarily, the word holy means to be set apart. And so set apart from the world, to be uh, set apart from the, the ways of uh, sin, and to be set apart uh, for the glory and purposes of God. And so when we are saved unto holiness, we are saved unto obedience, yes, but obedience to the glory of God and living in his purpose. In Ephesians 1 verse 3, Paul writes, For he, God, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 9, Paul writes that he, God, has saved us and calls us to a holy life. Right, and again, over and over and over in Scripture, we are uh, reminded that we are taken out of darkness into light. We are taken uh, from being objects of wrath to uh, having received mercy. And having received mercy, we are called to be in the world in a particular way, in a particular form. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 7 says that God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life life. And so we are saved from the wrath of God for sin, and we are saved to holiness. We are saved to purposeful, intentional, set-apart living to the glory of God. Another area uh, of parallel from, from last week. Last week we spent some time talking about how we are saved from the devil and his lies. And the, the parallel that I want to hit on here for us and to discuss is that we are saved for truth, salvation unto truth, right? In, in John 8 verse 31, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you 
free. What is Jesus saying here? That one of the characteristics of being a disciple of Jesus comes from knowing the truth, or comes by knowing the truth, comes with knowing the truth. And that in that truth, there is uh, freedom. That in that truth, there is uh, an understanding of life. And in that truth, there is an understanding of Jesus as he brings life. In Ephesians 4, verse 15, actually, Paul says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. And so, you see, there's this aspect in which the, the truth sets us free and the truth brings us to maturity. The truth sends us on a journey of life lived in, in searching out uh, God's design and purposes for us. To be saved then for the truth in part means that we are saved for a life of learning the truth. Right in Ephesians 4 and in, in John 8 and uh, throughout the Gospel of John over and over and over again, one of the things that we begin to see is that Jesus is the truth. That when we speak the truth in love, so we might grow in every respect to the maturity of him who is the head, that is Christ. What we'll see you know, uh, in a couple of verses in Ephesians 4 there is that truth that we speak is Jesus himself. Right? Jesus commands his disciples at the end of the Gospel of Matthew in Matthew 28, not only to go and to make disciples by baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, but also to teach them everything that he has commanded. Right? We are commanded, uh, 2 Peter 3.18 says, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, while we are saved from the devil and his lies, we are saved to the truth of who God is, the truth of Jesus Christ, and the truth that we are called to grow into the maturity of. That is fundamental to what it means to be a Christian. As well, last week in the first part of this video, we talked about being saved from what I, uh, I think rather creatively, called zombie living, right? That we are dead in our trespasses and sins. And now, the parallel to that is that we are saved for a full life, for uh, what scripture sometimes calls an abundant life, right? And John 10 verse 10 says, I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Uh, maybe your translation there says, and to have it abundantly. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 says, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things of God, the things God has prepared for those who love him. All right, we are uh, given full and abundant life. We are saved for a full and abundant life. And now let me be abundantly clear because there is, there is an idea in our world and in some parts of the church that wants to rob the true glory of this. There's an idea that talks about uh, the prosperity gospel, that talks about uh, material possessions and wealth being the kind of life that we are saved to. And there are uh, so-called Christian pastors who will teach you that and then talk about things like faith giving and how you can be rewarded uh, for your faithfulness to God. But this, the kind of life that God calls us to, the kind of Jesus, the life that Jesus is talking about when he says that we will have it abundantly, is not a life full of stuff or possessions. In fact, you see it over and over in the New Testament, right? That the, the disciples of Jesus are called to give up their possessions. They're called to sell all that they have and give half of it to the poor, to give everything to the poor. Right? The life that Jesus has called us to is not about material possessions. It's not about prosperity in this world. This really is about being fully human, fully alive, because we are focused on the things that really matter. Right? We're focused on the spiritual truths of who God is, the spiritual realities of who God is, that we have been blessed with every blessing in the heavenly realms. Jesus, in John 17, 
verse 3, he puts it this way. He says, now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The abundant life, eternal life, is to know Jesus, to know him as God, and to know him as the one whom God the Father sent to live the life I should have lived, to die the death that I deserved, and to be raised three days later victorious over sin and death, and to be ascended to the right hand of God the Father, and from there he and the Father together send the Spirit to take up residence in our hearts and souls, in our lives, that we might be heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, lavishly loved children of the Father. That is an abundant life. Another thing that we mentioned in the, the previous video was that we have been saved from our striving, right? Our efforts at work righteousness, our uh, efforts at obedience to try and earn a way into heaven. We've been saved from that. The parallel here is that we have been saved for freedom. I love this uh, from Galatians 5, where Paul says, It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. Because that's really what we've been talking about last week, right? Here in this being freed from, or saved from striving, is that we feel this burden, this weight of oppression, this yoke of uh, slavery to sin and to works righteousness and to, to an effort that constantly fa fails over and over again. And the good news of the gospel, the, the meaning of salvation is that we are saved for freedom, right? John 8 verse 36, so if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now, connected to this idea of being saved for freedom, uh, it's important to see that freedom looks a particular way, right? Freedom looks like serving one another in love. Again, in Galatians, Paul writes, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Right? Jesus says that the the greatest among you must become the least, that the first must become last, that, that Jesus came not to uh, be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this is the kind of uh, use that we have now for our freedom. Right? It, maybe it's cliche to say this at this point, but instead of striving to earn, we are thriving in freedom given by grace. And it turns out that thriving in grace actually looks like serving others in grace as well. And then finally, uh, we mentioned this at the end of the last video, but it's worth mentioning here again because it is critical for our understanding of salvation. We are saved for a community. We are saved to a community. The salvation of God brings us into a community of believers, other brothers and sisters who themselves have been adopted by grace through faith. We see this all over the place in the New Testament in the language of body, right, of being one body with many parts. But also uh, in Ephesians, we hear Paul say, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. Right? The, the prayer of Paul is that we would be uh, rooted and established in love by salvation in the gospel, and that that being rooted and established would, uh, together with all the Lord's holy people, together with the community that we have been made part of, we would begin to understand just how amazing grace is and just how awesome Christ is. 
And that's why uh, the author to the letter of Hebrews says in chapter 10, verse 24, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Because you see, human beings are created for community, right? God said to Adam way back in the beginning in Genesis 1 and 2, he said, it is not good for man to be alone. And so he made a, a partner for him. Right? He made a community for him. We know that God himself exists as a community. The Trinity is a community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so when God creates humanity, male and female, he created them in his image. We are made into the image of a community. Right? The greater truth here is that we are created for community and we are recreated into a community. We are saved into a community that we call the church, right? Romans 12 verse 5, in Christ we though many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. And just in this regard here, a couple of weeks ago it was Gem Sunday here in our church and uh, the Gems have been doing this theme of being Jesus friends together and we uh, explored with them through their theme what it looks like to practice uh, Christian friendships, what it looks like to be the kind of friend that Jesus was to us and that he calls us to be to others. And there we listed uh, five characteristics of what it means to be a Jesus friend. And so uh, you can check that out in our service from that Sunday. Um, but quickly there, we said that the, the one another's that we are uh, called to, the, the way that we are called to serve one another is to, uh, to love them and to serve one another, to pray for one another, to accept one another, and to be kind to each other. And the reality is, we can't obey all of the one another commands in Scripture if we're not around or if we're not a part of one another. We are saved unto a community, and that is God's design. That is God's definition of salvation. I want to thank you for joining us this week, and I want to encourage you to take this conversation and keep it going. Keep it going with those in your life, whether it's a care group or another small group or Bible study, or just the people around you that you see. Uh, may you experience the great and glorious truths of what salvation is, as we are saved from and we are saved for. God bless. Keep on studying.